Hi everyone, my name is Jacqueline Weber. I'm one of the midwives for, with Christmas, Christmas Trinity Clinic, and I'm with Selena Kennedy, and today we are talking all about labor. Um, a few first things, if you have any questions, just save those for the end. We're gonna open up a time where you can either ask questions and type them in, or you can unmute your microphone and ask the questions. We would ask that as you join, you would mute your microphones, um, just because the background noise can kind of interfere with us talking. So. Today is all about labor, and today we're in another birth suite. I actually talked about this a little bit last time, that we do have a room that has a birthing tub area where you all can labor in. And so this is where we're at today, and we're gonna start here and talk about that. Hey, the other thing that I want to say is that Christmas Training Clinic of BGYN, where we're employed, is actually a sister sort of ministry with um, Christus Good Shepherd Hospital. So we're in collaboration of doing these um, classes. The midwives only deliver at Good Shepherd. Um, it's our pride and joy. And we just want to encourage you to um, check it out if you haven't ever checked it out before. And if you're not, if you don't know where you're going to deliver, it's a great option for you. So um, like Jacqueline said, hold your questions till the end. We'll be glad to get to all of them. We're going to cover a lot of territory. Um, we're going to start with this birthing tub. Um, my background is that I did water births for a long time in an out-of-hospital setting, so I'm a believer in water um, birth and hydrotherapy. At this hospital, the policy is that you cannot deliver in the water, but you can use it for um, comfort while you're laboring. Um, now, there are a list of risk factors, and you have to use you have to go over those with your provider to make sure that you are um, a candidate for hydrotherapy during labor. When you're in the tub, you're not going to have an IV going all the time. You will have a saline lock. We still monitor the heartbeat, but we do it with a Doppler, and we do it in intermittently so that we know that you and your baby are safe. And um, the water is going to be a certain um, degree, so it's also safe for you and your baby. One of the things about the temperature of the water is that you will see a rise in your own heart rate and your baby's heart rate while you're in there. Um, it's very easy for us to get you in and out of there. When you get to about seven, eight centimeters, or when you're feeling that really gentle initial urges to push, we're gonna be getting you out and helping you to get in another position closer to the bed or on the bed, hopefully. So um, there's this is available. You do have to meet criteria to use it. You do need to have a discussion with your provider before you get here, and you have to sign a consent form for it. And those things will be placed on your chart, and then we will be able to pull those when we get here to the hospital with you. Um, you have a little more intense nursing um, at, at the tub side. Your nurse is gonna stay with you most of the time, which is a good thing. And um, we encourage you to, to ask questions about it and consider using it if you'd like to. So there's one other little thing, because I know that people ask questions about this. What if you have a bowel movement while you're in the tub? We're gonna get it out with this. And um, don't be embarrassed about it. It actually just means your baby's coming down and your body's doing all the right things. And so it should be an encouraging thing, not an embarrassing thing, because that's not how we look at it at all. The other thing is that, I don't know if you can see back here, but we have a floating thermometer and it lets us know what the temperature is, and we have to keep a running um, monitoring on what the temperature is so that it's safe for you. We don't want the water too cold so that um, you get too cool and it prohibits you from laboring well. So that's about all with the tub. The tub does not have jets in it because that would allow possible growth of bacteria that wouldn't be good for you and your baby. So it is only a soaking tub. It's very, very deep. It covers the abdomen, which is what you want to help encourage contractions and labor. It's nice. actually a very good pool to, to labor in. And it is small in this area, but it is big enough to work, and it's big enough that your support person can be with you, not in the tub, but alongside you. And there's lights in the tub as well, so if you wanted to turn off the lights, if you can kind of see, there's lights going on in here, and they kind of turn colors green and purple, and so you can get a really nice kind of ambiance going. We can dim all of the lights in the room, so that's another really great feature about this tub. I'll turn the lights back on just so you can see us a little bit better. One of the other things I always talk to my patients about is that if you don't like small places, 
this may not be the room for you, okay? If you feel like you're going to labor more using birth ball, peanut ball, moving around in your room, this room is really, really small. And it's a good room, it's, it's a beautiful room, but it may not be the room for you. So really think about what your priorities are with your labor and what's really gonna be important to you before you choose this room. Because we have some people who get in and they don't like the water and they get out, but then they're still in this smaller room. And when everybody gets in this room, it's pretty full. Um, so that's the only other consideration that you need to have regarding use of the tub, okay? Now we're gonna move on to talk about some other things. Right. So when you're in labor, there are some things that you will um, possibly experience and some things that you'll see that a lot of people have questions about. And um, one of those things is, when if you break my water, what do you use? What kind of tool do you use? Well, this is an amulet, and this is what we use. I can get it open. And as most people say, it looks like a big crochet hook, just like this. And as we check your cervix, we slide it in, and it just has a little tiny hook on the end, and it just snags that bag of water and lets the fluid just slowly come out. So you may be seeing this. It's okay not to break the water. There's no long way about that. There is a train of thought that if you break the water, then it is um, makes your labor harder, and it makes um, it's not as good for your baby because your baby's head is um, then um, uses a wedge against the cervix. Either way, whether you have your water broken or not, that's happening. And if your labor is kind of cutting around and you're not really getting anywhere, contractions are irregular. This is one of the first things that we would recommend because actually checking the cervix and breaking the water causes a prostaglandin surge, which will make the contractions a little more efficient. And with the pressure of the baby's head directly on the cervix, it actually will cause those contractions to be more efficient too. So this is one of the things, this is an ambient hook. Okay, and Jacqueline is gonna talk about another tool. So sometimes we need to do some extra monitoring. It could be because we're not able to keep your baby's heart rate on. You know, those external monitors, they can only do so much. And so it could be a position thing. Or sometimes we really want to take a closer look at what baby's doing inside. Now, if, if we do feel like we need to do some extra monitoring, we do have some tools that you might see. One of them is called a fetal scalp electrode. And I'm going to open this up for you to see. The fetal scalp electrode is a monitor that goes right underneath the baby's scalp. It's a very tiny, tiny um, little uh, hook. And it will help us to monitor the baby's heart rate in a very accurate way. You have to have your water broken. So sometimes we break water to be able to play some of these monitors because it's important for us to know what the baby's doing. If we're concerned that the baby is a tolerating labor and we're not able to monitor you well, this is something that you might see. So I'm going to go a little bit closer because I want you to see. So the very end of this, there's a little spiral. There's a little spiral right here. I don't know. If, I think you can see that. See how tiny that is? So I could put that on the end of my finger and it doesn't even hurt, okay? So I don't want you to think that we're hurting baby because I don't believe that we are. Um, but this would go right underneath that baby's scalp inside. We would, play, we would place it kind of just like we do a vaginal exam, just like how we would break your water. We would go in with those fingers. We would twist it just right underneath the scalp. We pull this applicator out, and then all that stays in is, is just this little catheter. So this will help us monitor the baby. So this might be something that you see. The other thing would be a contraction monitor. This is an internal contraction monitor. It's called an intrauterine pressure catheter. This would also be to monitor your contractions inside. So the external monitor that we put on your belly, that's just gonna tell us when you're having your contractions and how long you're having your contractions. It actually doesn't tell us how strong your contractions are. We do a lot of feeling of your belly during your labor to know if they are 
mild, moderate, hard. So we do kind of know what your contraction strength is, but not accurately. So you might be getting a contraction monitor. This monitor as well needs to be placed after your water breaks. The other great thing about this monitor is that if your baby needs a little extra fluid, let's say your water has been broken for a while, or when your water does break, a lot of water comes out. Sometimes babies start laying on their umbilical cord somewhere, and they don't love those contractions. This is a great way for us to be able to give you some extra fluid up there and kind of help that baby tolerate labor so much better. So we do it for two reasons. We went either one, we need to see where your contractions are at, how strong they are, what if your labor is stalled, we need to know how strong your contractions are. Or we want to um, we want to give you some extra fluid for baby. So this is this does not go on baby at all, but it will be placed similar, just like the scalp electrode and just like the water breaking, just like a vaginal veil. We're gonna place it right inside the uterus. It's just a catheter. It's very flexible and plastic. But on the end of it, it's got these holes, as you can see. So we place this inside, and then we're able to hook up some fluid and give you extra fluid inside. But this will just hang out inside the uterus and just tell us the actual amount of pressure going on inside the uterus. It's a very helpful tool. So this is something else you might see. So one of the things that you need to know about all of these things is that, especially midwives, we're very non-intervented. And we only use these things if it is a dire necessity. Yes. We don't use them because we know that there are increased risk of infection and other things going on, even though it's very, very tiny increase in risk. So don't think that when you come, you're just automatically going to see all these things. We just want you to be aware of them in case we do need to use them, but we only need them if absolutely necessary. And we talk to you about it before we do it. You're going to know every single thing that's happening, and we're going to talk you through the process. So you don't have to be worried about things happening to you and your baby that you didn't want, okay? So in order to be able to use all these, we have to establish the fact that you're in labor. And a lot of people are wonder, what's the difference between Braxton and Hitz contractions? What are real contractions like? When do I go to the hospital? Um, labor can be very confusing, especially if you've had other children because you have lots of warm-up things going on and you it catches you off guard and you're not sure. I can promise you that when you go from Braxton Hicks contractions to labor contractions, you're going to know the difference. My midwife said that to me. I didn't believe her, but she looked very right, okay? So one of the things I'm going to do, some of you might have seen this. This is um, just kind of like a um, model of like a uterus, okay? There's a little ping pong ball in there. So one of the things I want to demonstrate on here is the difference between contractions. If you're having Braxton Hicks contractions, they really just kind of squeeze like this. They don't go all the way around the uterus. They only squeeze in the middle. And the purpose of those sometimes is to reposition the baby to get the baby in the right position. Sometimes it's just toning the uterus, getting the, the um, uterus ready. Sometimes they happen because you're dehydrated, you haven't had enough fluid, or you've been up on your feet a lot, um, or you've had sex. Okay? So when these contractions happen, this is kind of like the cervix down here. So when these contractions happen, you notice that the cervix is not getting short and you're not dilating at all, okay? But when you have real contractions, the power is in the top of the uterus. And when you actually have those contractions and they're squeezing down, you can see how the, the cervix is actually getting shorter and the cervix eventually will start opening up. So effacement is one of the most important parts of labor. Okay, once you get that cervix really, really thin, that's when your it can open up the most. And we can keep doing that, but eventually the ball is just going to fly out because it's going to be completely dilated. But I just wanted you to see the difference in Braxton Hitz contractions that don't affect the cervix at all, and then real contractions where the power is up here, and it really does actually thin the cervix and start to open it up. So one of the things about contractions is when do I go to the hospital? So if my rule of thumb with my patients is if you have contractions that are six or seven minutes apart or greater, 
you're not really in active labor yet. You can stay home, eat, drink, relax, soak in the tub, rest, save up your energy for later on that day or not because that's when the real thing's going to start. Um, if you have contractions consistently about five minutes apart or less and you know they're getting harder and you have them for an hour or two, um, go ahead and come in. You're probably in labor and you're going to be staying. Now, if you have something happen like your water break or if you have bright red bleeding that's heavy like a period, not bloody show, but if you have bright red bleeding that's heavy like a period, you need to go ahead and come in so that we can check you out and make sure that everything's okay. Once your water breaks, we consider that time clock having started. Um, you're more susceptible to infection. We also want to make sure the cord hasn't prolapsed. We want to make sure that the baby's in a good position. And a lot of times if your baby breaks, if your water breaks early, it's because your baby may not be in the best position and we want to be able to work with you to get that, that baby in a better position early on. So that's when you come to the hospital. Let's talk about mucus flow. You can lose mucus plug sometimes up to five or six weeks before you actually have a baby. The uterus and the cervix down here is very thick, like about this thick. And in the sides of that cervix, there are little um, vaults or little crypts, and they're full of mucus and liquid. And as your cervix begins to thin out and dilate, those start to slowly open up and release all of that. And um, so that's where it comes from. Your body rebuilds some of it, and it does not mean that you're going to deliver within 24 to 48 hours like you read in some of the places on the Internet. That's just not true. But it is a good indication that your cervix is doing something, so be thankful for it and greet that with an open heart. Don't be frustrated that your labor's not starting. Be glad that, that something is going on in there, though. Um, so other things about labor, once you get here, and they've established that you're going to stay because you're in labor. You don't have to stay in the bed. We want you moving around. We want you um, comfortable. You, this is a time when you can use the tub. This is a time you can be side to side in the bed. You can make your bed like a chair and sit in there. You can use a birthing ball. You can use um, the peanut ball. If you're very low risk, you don't even have to be monitored continuously. But we do have a policy in this hospital that you have a strip on your baby every hour for 10 minutes. If they see something that doesn't look um, exactly the way we would like to see it, then you're gonna have longer periods of monitoring. But if everything's okay, you can come off. When you get to about eight centimeters, you will be monitored continuously because of head compression and the baby making the descent down the birth canal, you need to be monitored all the time so that we can be sure that your baby's okay. A lot of times with descent and head compression, a heart tones will go down at the peak of a contraction, and that's very normal. The thing is, is it needs to rise very quickly at the um, conclusion of that contraction, and we need to make sure that it's doing that. So those are just some things about labor that um, are probably helpful for you to know. Um, you're, the nurses here at Good Shepherd are also midwives at heart. They are excellent, they are natural minded. Whether you have an epidural or whether you're trying for a natural birth, they're gonna be at the bedside and they're gonna be helping you with all those things. But there's one thing that you need to remember about all of us, we don't read minds. So if there's something that you really, really want, you need to vocalize that and you need to um, let us know that that's what your heart's desire is so that we can help you with that because we want you to have the birth that you want. We understand you don't get a redo and so we want it right the first time and part of excellent patient care is making sure that you are listened to and that you have what you need and have what you'd like to have within reason. If you're very high risk, I would hope that you would consider that carefully and understand that we may not be able to do all of those things because we have to make sure that you and your baby are very safe. Jacqueline, do you have anything you want to add? Um, just one other thing, if the other reason we would want you to go into the hospital would be if you didn't feel your baby move. So yes. those, those are, that's another real important thing. Um, and then as far as labor, sometimes people have really painful contractions that are Rex and Hicks, they're not really changing the cervix. And we get a lot of questions about that. A lot of times it's because the baby is not in a good position. And this is just a really brief overview of labor because we really want to do a whole, you know, topic on just labor. But it's really important for you prenatally to be ready, getting your body ready for labor. And a lot of that is about 
um, getting the baby in a good position, which could be chiropractic th therapy, physical therapy, prenatal yoga, um, nutrition, hydration, these things, you know, all prepare your body, you know, very, in the very beginning, you can be preparing your body for a healthy, active labor. So yes, you can have painful contractions and not dilate. And usually that's because the baby isn't in a great position, not always, but usually. So be mindful of those things, even first trimester, start getting your body ready for a healthy labor. And you do it by doing that is being, um, getting your pelvis, Balance. I really recommend prenatal yoga to all my patients. If you can do chiropractic care, that's even better. But some people can't do that, and that's fine because you can do a lot of free YouTube stuff as well for yourself. So, and I'll go into that more when we do our labor topic. A really quick hint is that when you're um, while you're pregnant, don't slump when you sit because your baby tends to be in a posterior position. Always sit straight, lean forward a bit. That's why it's good to sit on an exercise ball or sit on a high back chair backwards. Don't cross your knees like this, like I'm doing. Yeah. It keeps your baby in the right position. Got to be balanced. I, I, I hardly ever do that for real. Okay, so now we're going to move on and we're going to um, have a guest today and um, he'll introduce himself and he's going to talk to you a little bit about um, epidurals and the things you need to know about. There's a lot of questions. Whether you choose to have that or think that you're going to have that or not, you still need to have that education just in case. He's really, really good at it. When you come in, if he's here, you're going to be lucky. And he, so we're going to kind of um, transition and get him in a place where he can share some information with you. I'm pretty tall too, so. Just been home. Hello, I'm Dan. I'm a nurse anesthetist here at the hospital, and we do the epidurals uh, for our ladies that are ready to have a baby. Uh, there's about ten of us, so if you come in, uh, you'll meet one of us, and we'll come by and talk to you before the epidural. I'm going to go through basically what we talk about before we do the epidural, and then show you some of the epidural and where we put it on my spine model. Um, when you come in, uh, you'll get uh, put on the monitor, they'll start your induction, or if you're already in labor, they'll uh, get IV started, and then when you start hurting, they'll call us, and we'll come over and talk to you, and we usually um, go over the pre-op with you before we do the epidural, uh, especially if it's your first time getting one. And what we talk about are some of the risks and uh, how we do it. So when we get ready to do it, we'll sit you up, and you'll sit on the side of the bed, like this, and bend over, and we'll put the epidural in right in the lower back. I got it out of the screen again. So this is your coccyx, and these are your lumbar vertebrae, and we usually put it in between this one and this one, somewhere in here. Uh, so it'll be on your lower back, and then we put a catheter in. And the catheter goes in the epidural space. And the catheter is small, and the catheter will stay with you until you deliver. Oh, my thought for me. Here's our catheter. And it, this is the only thing that will be left in, is a small catheter. And it'll be in your spine and threaded up along the outside of your spinal canal, on the spinal cord. Now, when we put it in, the spinal cord isn't one solid uh, uh, tube, so it kind of branches up where that is, so the chance of any risk to your spinal cord is very, very minimal. There are some side effects. Uh, one thing is when we put it in, your blood pressure is going to go down a little bit. That's normal. If it goes down too much, it may make you sick at your stomach or make the baby's heart rate go down. We would give you some medicine in your IV to get it back up. We may have to turn you from side to side or put some oxygen on it. Usually that lasts about 10 minutes. Um, and we usually give medicine to maybe 10% uh, of the patients after an epidural. Also, there's a small chance that we put it in and it doesn't work or only works on one side. If the epidural goes into this uh, spine and goes off to one side on this side or the other, it'll only numb up that side. Um, we can't x-ray it to make sure where it's at because of the pregnancy. So if it is uh, only working on one side, we may try to give you extra medicine to make it work on the other. 
or where we may replace it. We end up replacing about 5 to 10% of the epidurals here. And usually, uh, I don't think we've ever had to replace one twice. Um, another side effect is an epidural headache. If we put the catheter or the needle a little too far, it can make a small hole that leaks spinal fluid. And uh, that spinal fluid helps cushion your brain. So if it leaks out and when you sit up, your brain will settle on the base of your skull and give you a really bad headache. It won't cause brain damage or anything like that, but it is a pretty serious headache. And the reason uh, we like to talk about it, even though it's very rare, is if it happens and it doesn't go away in 24 hours, we'll have to do a blood patch, which means we'll take some blood like they do to send a lab and do another epidural, except instead of the catheter that I showed you, we'll just inject some blood and your clotting factors in your blood will uh, clot that little leak up and make it stop leaking. Uh, it is a, another procedure and you're usually in the hospital an extra day or so. But the chances of it happening here are about 1% or maybe even a little less. Uh, if you get an epidural for labor and you end up having to have a C-section, then we will give you some extra strong medicine in the epidural and it'll numb you up completely to right below your chest. And we'll take you back and do the C-section. You'll be awake. Uh, and when the baby's out, we'll take pictures or uh, and if, once the baby's out, if you want to uh, get some medicine to go to sleep, we can do it. But we try not to give any medicine before the baby's out so the baby's nice and, and awake when it's born. If you come in for a C-section, we'll do a spinal, which is similar to the epidural. It's a smaller needle, and we inject the medicine directly into your spinal canal. But there's no catheter. It's just for one injection, and you're done. Uh, it makes you really numb. Lasts about an hour and a half long enough to have a C-section, get you back to your room and I keep you comfortable for another 30 or 45 minutes uh, before it wears off. Oh. And then also, because I have questions about whether or not it's going to run out. The, the pump won't run out. <laughs> We've got a whole drawer full of medicine. Once the catheter's in, we'll put it on a pump. Then I can't get off the pump. <laughs> and it's a it's a small a cartridge with 100 cc's, and the one we put on lasts about eight hours. And we have we'll just it runs out eight hours. We'll replace it. Uh, I've had epidurals run for 36 hours in the past. Uh, I don't know what we would average eight or ten hours probably normally, uh, but it'll run as long as you're in labor. Uh, we'll keep it running. This is Aaron. Hi. She's pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> when we come in to do the epidural, we'll have you sit on the side of the bed, and if you're really tall, we'll raise the bed up. And we'll have sterile gloves and a gown, but since we're not really doing it, I'm not going to put everything on today. We'll clean your back with iodine. It's cold, and if you have an allergy to iodine on your skin, you need to let us know. Uh, we have other things that we can use. After it's nice and clean, we'll put a drape on to keep everything uh, sterile. And then uh, we do the part that's the most uncomfortable is we'll numb you up with some lidocaine like you get at the dentist office. It'll be a small injection of lidocaine. Uh, about like getting an IV started or your blood work drawn, maybe even a, a little less painful. Once that's numb, then we'll use the needle, the epidural needle that's hollow. We'll put it in and find the right spot, and then we put the catheter through the needle, and it goes into the epidural space. And then once the catheter is in, we take the needle out and leave the catheter in to give you medicine for it. The catheter will be taped on your back and go over your shoulder, and it'll hook up to the pump with another long piece of tubing and run continuously until you deliver. Uh, we went over the side effects and the possible problems. So talk to them about how they have to position uh, okay. the back out. Uh, when we position, you want to do where it opens up the bones in the bottom of your spine. And most ladies, when they do it, they go like this, but you have to push your back out. Yeah, don't do that. In position, it's best if you drop your shoulders 
and drop your back so we can feel the bones down here. Uh, and we usually take a, a couple of minutes to get you positioned really uh, like we want you because that actually has more to do with the success of facing a catheter than most anything else is the position that you're in. So it's nice to uh, get in a good position. Sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it takes 15 minutes, but normally no more than 10 or 15 minutes to get the catheter in and lay you down. Once we start the medicine, usually you'll have three or four contractions and they'll just steadily get uh, less painful and less painful and then go away. As you get ready to deliver and the baby gets lower, you'll feel pressure. Uh, we can't numb you up enough to make the pressure go away and it may be a little bit of uncomfortable pressure, uh, but it's not sharp pain like labor pain. And that pressure just lets you know that it's time to deliver the baby. Anything else? So, um, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have questions? Yeah. Now's the time you can ask questions if you'd like to for, for Dan or for us as mid-boss. We'd love to be able to answer your questions for you. We're going to have another um, Zoom class next Thursday at the same time. It'll be the last one in this series of four. And we encourage you to come and be there. We're also going to soon um, put a link up so that they will be available for you in an archive so that you can go back and you can watch all of them at your convenience. After that, we will share with you a plan about what we're going to do for ongoing education. We'll actually be taking topics and doing a whole Zoom class on one topic at a time, probably. So we'll cover breastfeeding in more detail. We'll cover um, anesthesia in more detail. Um, we'll have other guest speakers like pediatricians and also some of our OBs that um, are our supervising physicians that we have to go to when we have problems. Um, and other people in the hospital that might um, be part of your treatment team when you're here. Um, that's one thing that Good Shepherd's really good about. We work as a team. So even though you choose one provider, you get a whole team. Sometimes you never see part of that team, but and you're not thinking about them, but I can guarantee you they're always thinking about you. So we have a question. At what point do you ask for the epidural? Uh, usually it's uh, up to you and your midwife or physician and the nurse. Uh, we used to, 15 years ago, wanted ladies to be a three or a four, but sometimes getting to a three or a four is very painful. And the studies have shown that it doesn't uh, slow down the labor anymore and put it in early than it does having to wait till you're four. So usually we like to see that you're in a nice labor pattern and that maybe you're dilated a couple of centimeters and uh, most of the time, once they start the tosin, that's when the painful, the contractions get more painful, and that's usually when we do it. Uh, don't wait till you're 10, <laughs> <laughs> or 9, or even 8. Uh, usually after 9 or 10 centimeters, sitting up uh, is kind of hard because uh, you're kind of wanting to push. Uh, the nurse will, will be more talking to you about, they kind of make the decision on that, and then they just call us. Do y'all have any parameters that you go by before you call? No. I if you're hurting in. and you request it, we're going to get it for you. Yeah. I put them in at, at when you're not dilated, and I put them in at 10. So. You also have to know that before you get an epidural, if you would like to try IV pain medication, we do have that available for you, too. Some people are pretty ambivalent about using an epidural. There's a lot of myths surrounding using an epidural, and we'd like to answer those questions for you. But in lieu of time, we'll just talk about the fact that at this hospital right now, we're using fentanyl. You can actually have fentanyl based on what your provider um, orders for you. Some people get it every hour. Some people get a dose every couple of hours. It actually works fairly well. But after a few doses, honestly, the receptor sites, the pain receptor sites are overloaded, and it begins to not be as effective. So sometimes that's when people opt to go ahead and do an epidural. Now, you also have to know we're not going to be trying to force you to have any pain medication or an epidural at all. These are your choices to make. We're here to educate you and help you make the, the choice that's best for you. Your nurse will walk, work alongside you, but she is not going to be bombarding you with, let's get an epidural, let's get an epidural. She's not going to do that. So you're going to have to be proactive and stand up for yourself and, and let people know what you want. Again, we're not mind readers. Um, so the other thing about that is that um, once you get an epidural, you are in the bed, okay? But you're not still in the bed. 
Our nurses are really, really good. They're the best. And they are going to turn you, move you around, make sure that that baby is descending well. And they're also going to make sure that you have all the other things that you need. Like they're going to keep you clean and dry. They're going to make sure you have support between your legs, like a peanut ball or pillows. They're very attentive to your needs. If you need something, all you have to do is ask, OK? Um, so does anybody have any other questions regarding pain management? And um, sometimes positions that you're in actually relieve pain too. So that's one of our goals is to get you in um, optimal positions so that your body can respond to labor well, the baby can descend, and you're the most comfortable that you can be. Anyway, we are done for the day. We appreciate you um, tuning in and watching us. We hope that you're here next week. Tell your friends. Remember that if you um, are looking for a provider, um, Chris is Good Shepherd, OBGYN, is taking patients every day. We have appointments that are available every day, so you can get in. Even if you call early in the morning, we're going to get you in that day if you need to come in that day. And, um, you know, one of the missions of the Christus ministry is to extend the healing hand of Christ, of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to do for you. We want to help you any way that we can. We want to walk alongside you with your journey and having a baby. We want to pray with you, cry with you, laugh with you, and celebrate with you. We're here for all of that. You're more than just, just a patient having a baby. Our goal is to get to know you, love you. You're our friend. You're part of our family. Y'all have a good day, and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.